I drink, because I'm a bad drinker, I'll tell you that, Johnny. When I drink the next day, I gotta do two things. I gotta try and locate my car, and I gotta bring back the car I took. I mean, I'm a... <laughs> Good morning. It's Friday, Aristotle Friday, October the 13th, and this is The True Conservative. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. So today, after the serenity prayer and the patriotic song of the day, we will have Maria Bartiromo, My Take, False Neutrality, No Free Lunch, Rules for Patriots, Rules for Retrogrades, The Rape of the Mind, Ayn Rand Quote, Bishop Barron, and Aristotle. All that and more when I get back. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Thank you, thank you. And now there's no free lunch. 250 Economic Truths by David Bonson. Nothing is more deadly to achievement than the belief that effort will not be rewarded, that the world is a bleak and discriminatory place in which only the predatory and the specially preferred can get ahead. George Gilder. How cronyism can destroy the human spirit and create extreme cynicism is perhaps its worst component. Human action is a powerful force and human inaction equally so. When one believes the game is rigged, inactivity results. Cronyism strikes at the incentives of free enterprise and robs the would-be economic actor of aspiration. In this sense, cronyism joins collectivism as the primary enemy of a free and virtuous society. And that was There's No Free Lunch by David Bonson. Back in a minute.
Thank you, thank you. And now, the rape of the mind. The trader who consciously takes option for the other side. In my study of political traders and collaborators, I found that most of them shared two common characteristics. They were easily influenced by minds stronger than their own, and none of them would admit his disloyalty as an act of treason. The traders I interviewed always volunteered innumerable justifications of their behavior, always surrounded their treachery with a complicated web of sophisms and rationalizations. Actually, they could not tolerate an objective picture of their actions. If they did, they would condemn themselves out of their own mouths. Unconsciously, most of them realized the nature of their crimes and were tormented by guilt feelings. These guilt feelings would have been unbearable if they'd admitted, even to themselves, the enormity of their deeds. During the Nazi occupation of the Low Countries, I saw these qualities demonstrated again and again. Many of our native traders were spineless people, ready to accept almost any new idea or elaborate theory. Their suggestibility was their greatest liability. Most of these would-be Nazis had never possessed strong personalities of their own. They had failed in their ambitions and had been disappointed in life. And they readily transferred their frustrated personal longings to a political will of the wisps. After the German invasion and occupation, these people confronted their defeated countrymen with triumphant I told you so's. They boasted proudly of their wisdom in having bet on the right horse. They gained a tremendous feeling of self-importance. And their newly acquired, blown-up self-assurance, backed by the enemy's armed force, made them hard and contemptuous of their compatriots. In an effort to justify their own behavior and their greed for power, they tried to convert others to their new way of life. They were possessed by a compulsion to become propagandists for the invader. Turncoats always try to soothe their own bad consciences by persuading others to share their crime. Of course, they had some real grievances. Everybody does. But these traitors were influenced less by them than by fancied injustices. Through acts of treason, they avenged themselves on society for the private wrongs they had suffered because of their personal failures. Their resentments could be felt in everything they said. The Nazi strategists were experts in exploiting this sense of dissatisfaction. They seemed to know intuitively whether or not an individual could be ensnared by Nazi propaganda. One case I knew of in Holland concerned an ex-director of a large concern who had been ousted from his position on ethical grounds. Early in the occupation, this man received an invitation to join the Nazi ranks, and in surprisingly short time, he became the leader of an important Nazi business. The Nazis gave him the feeling of having been vindicated. Among the recruits for the Nazi police force in the occupied territories were turncoats of all sorts, and even the inmates of asylums for the criminally insane. The pathological grudge these people had against society was the foil by which the Nazis turned them into traitors. The Germans themselves despised these men, but they were cunning enough to put them to the best possible use. The Nazis also played a strange game with some authors and artists who had not received enough appreciation. The enemy flattered these men by buying and praising their work. The artists were first told they could write and create as they pleased, without fear of interference. Gradually, little political services were asked of them. Tiny little concessions like favorable report of a meeting or a favorable reference to a philosophy with which they did not agree. It is the impact of that first little concession that starts the inner avalanche of self-justification that finally leads to self-betrayal. Following the first compromise and self-justification comes the second. And this one is met with shrewder self-exculpations. After all... The compromiser has had experience in rationalization by now. The repeated concessions turn into submission and voluntary cooperation. As I said before, once a man is seduced into a small ideological concession, it is very difficult for him to stop. From now on, his imagination produces enough justifications which help him maintain his self-respect. The inwardly insecure traitor always feels the urge to identify with the enemy, the hostile invader. He has never belonged never had a feeling of identification with his own group, has never felt the rewards of such cohesion, nor has he won the love, sympathy, and respect of his fellows. Therefore, he wants to join the others. He may even go so far as to call his former friends traitors. Lord Hall Hall, William Joyce, the British traitor who was executed by his government, considered himself a real Aryan German, and in this way justified his fight against England. 
In the hectic days immediately following the Nazi invasion of Holland, I found myself an occasional inner temptation to go over to the enemy, to the stronger party with its powerful organizations, all ready to support one, to back one up. I even had a dream about visiting Hitler and convincing him in a childish and friendly way of the righteousness of our cause. I did not succumb to this dream temptation, but there were a few who fell for such infantile pictures and were unable to withstand their need to submit. The need to conform, to be accepted, to be safe and respectable is deeply embedded in man. In our analysis of the inner forces that lead men to surrender their mental integrity under the pressure of prison and concentration camp life, we saw how important a role this mechanism plays. Living in a country occupied by the enemy is by no means as horrifying as living in a POW or concentration camp, but it is nevertheless frightening. And in this frightening situation, the need to conform may show itself in surrender to the enemy ideology. Those who resisted this need, even though they felt it, usually became more fervently anti-Nazi as a consequence of their guilt feelings about this impulse to treachery. This war experience taught us another truth. Traitors can be made by overwhelming collective suggestions. In the ambiguous chaos of shouting ideologies and changing values, the mind becomes sullen and stubborn. And where there is immaturity and lack of inner control, it may become confused in its loyalties and simply surrender to the most powerful group. The Nazis, with their perverted political methods, tried to supply the weak, the ambitious, the disgruntled, and the frustrated with a ready-made set of bogus ideals to justify surrender to their side. In Mein Kampf, Hitler says that when the disappointed are given a sense of importance, they may swallow every suggestion with the utmost docility. He knew that human weakness, even kindness, can be used as a starting point for a systematically nurtured conversion. Hitler knew, too, that unlimited political terror could make a traitor of almost anyone, spread fear, terror, and hunger, inflict penetrating pain, and finally, as a result of mental coercion and growing confusion, many will succumb and even betray their own families. In many of the concentration camps, the victims themselves were in charge of the gas chamber killings and kept their gruesome jobs until their own turns came. Fear and terror had made willless slaves out of them. There is still another human characteristic that can lead to treason and betrayal. There are some people who simply do not know where their loyalties belong. The case of Klaus Fuchs, the man who betrayed atomic secrets to Russia, is a dramatic example of this. Here was a highly intelligent person, an expert on most difficult theoretical problems, lost in a sea of conflicting loyalties. Because of the Nazi persecution of his Quaker family, he adopted a new fatherland, England. In the meantime, he carried a dream of a mystical universal world which he thought to find in the totalitarian ideology. In the midst of his confusion about world problems, he simply did not know where his loyalty should be. This was not the case of schizophrenia or a Jekyll and Hyde situation, as the newspapers reported, but a case of confusion of loyalties in a hyperintellectual mind. Fuchs did not know emotionally where he belonged. In other cases, people were literally pushed into treason and collaboration because nobody in their environment trusted them. This happened, for instance, in Flanders with the collaborators of the First World War. Several of them were compelled to become collaborators again. This analysis of the factors that lead men to treason certainly does not imply that every man must remain loyal to the group from which he has originally received his morals and ideals. Better insight and higher ethics may override our childhood loyalties. It is the fate and the need of human beings to go beyond.
Thank you. Thank you. And now, rules for retrogrades, 40 tactics to defeat the radical left. Rule 36. Young retrogrades should be neither sheep nor wolves, but sheep dogs. Young men should be taught to fight according to the mantra, never start fights, but finish them. Being smart or proficient at debate is no longer good enough in 2019 America. The time for flabby, comfortable, conservative leisure is at an end. The battle of ideas is quickening to the point at which it will soon become an actual battle. Hence, our last few rules involve grouping and preparatory criteria, who and how to prepare. We are mustering to stand and fight, not only retrogrades, but all men of goodwill who may be counted upon. But first, retrogrades must make themselves worthy of a fight. Rocky did not fight Apollo without a rigorous training regimen executed over a grueling period of time. Radicals categorically avoid non-rigged exchanges of ideas where they cannot interrupt or yell because they are aware that they are fated to fail in contests of ideas. It was the radical Marx who said that the purpose of philosophy is not understanding the world, but changing it. The radicals do not care if their formulations are correct. They only care about power. This explains why they turn to displays of semi-force and outright force instead of learning from their errors in debate. Only good men heed their past errors. Radicals simply learn how to implement force, giving the flimsy appearance of righteousness to wrong conclusions. A retrograde must be able to stand down any radical when the eventuality of the radical's defeat in the battle of wits inevitably coaxes forth the violent response from him. While such a statement did not correctly modify the status of the world a decade or two ago, it is one of the final and most important rules for retrogrades. Prepare for battle. Hopefully the battle won't be necessary, but this hope for peace grows more foolish as each day passes. To this end, the retrograde must maintain physical fitness in order to maintain, rather to regain, the imposing male standard of the West. While not every man has the time or training or talent to become proficient in the martial arts, virtually every man has 30 minutes per day to train at home with weights. That way, even a martially untrained retrograde can exercise an imposing presence in the public defense of ideas. And that was Rule 36 from uh, Rules for Retrogrades, 40 Tactics to Defeat the Radical Left by uh, Timothy and David Gordon. And uh, so I, he's talking to, again, he doesn't make the distinction, and he should, but he's talking to rank and file, you and me. We're the ones that are supposed to go out and start lifting weights. Uh, and then he makes the error of saying, don't start, but finish. Well, that's crap. That's one of the parts of our culture that is absolutely 100% wrong. When you go into uh, doing martial arts and boxing, boxing's better. It's one of the best because they teach you how to go on offense in boxing. Most martial arts, karate and whatnot, it's all about defensive. You, you stand there and wait for the other guy to swing first, and that's a recipe for disaster. So there's certain circumstances in which you're going to have to swing first. And uh, you got to be able to recognize those situations and act accordingly. Back in a minute.
Thank you, thank you. And now, Rules for Patriots by Steve Deese. In one of my all-time favorite movies, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, Captain Kirk gets his nemesis Khan to lose his cool and manipulates him into a trap by saying, Khan, I'm laughing at your superior intellect. Making fun of the foolishness of the left's magical thinking by using their own premises against them wins people over to our side and also diminishes their credibility. Beyond the obvious double standard that exists, one of the reasons why liberal comedians get away with being more vicious than conservative commentators is because people find them funny. People let you absolutely annihilate your opponent if you make them laugh while you're doing it. What I have learned doing talk radio is that when I only go after our opponents using harsh language, I can at times offend even those who agree with me. But if I use humor, almost everybody gives me permission to be vicious, provided it's funny. If you make them laugh, it's almost as if the public gives you permission to swing away. But to be able to use humor and snark, that effectively requires an inner joy. And that inner joy comes from only a deep, abiding faith that, no matter what, God is still on the throne. The more I've grown in my faith, the more I believe my heavenly daddy can beat up their earthly daddy. The more I believe my daddy can beat up their daddy, the more peace I have about the future. The more peace I have about the future, the easier it is for me to relax and not always react emotionally. The easier it is for me to relax and not always react emotionally, the easier it is for me to find the humor or joy in all but the most tragic of circumstances. And the more I can use humor to make my point, the more likely I will get my point across. People ask me all the time how it seems like we're having so much fun chronicling the fall of Western civilization on the radio. And I take that question as a compliment. Proving the emperor has no clothes doesn't just defeat your enemy. It depants them. The reason men like William F. Buckley, C.S. Lewis, and G.K. Chesterton are so often quoted is because they had the wisdom and wit to rhetorically remove their opponent's still beating heart from his chest and show it to everybody with one skillful turn of a phrase. That doesn't mean there's not a time and place for passion and or righteous indignation. Heck, I could probably title my radio program Righteous Indignation some nights. I come to work each night with the jawbone of an ass and a whip of cords ready to go. But if I really believe in the God of providence expressed in the final verse of our national anthem, there's no reason to be so uptight and antsy all the time. Incessant hand-wringing is not a heavenly virtue. Besides, if folks don't want to do what's right, the eternal accountability they'll face from God is far more lethal and terrifying than anything I have the power to devise this side of eternity anyway. Just kick the dust off your sandals slash cowboy boots and move on. By all means, never stop clinging to your guns and your Bibles, but there's no need to do so bitterly. Let's engage in one more exercise in reversing the premise and use the hot button issue of illegal immigration to do it. In a clear attempt to pander for Hispanic votes during the 2012 presidential campaign, President Obama unilaterally enacted amnesty for illegals by refusing to enforce the law see that as violate his oath of office, in cases involving 880,000 illegal aliens. Now, notice I didn't accept the premise they're undocumented immigrants any more than a carjacking is an undocumented repossession. One of the arguments frequently used by amnesty advocates like Obama and even some misguided Christian leaders who don't have a theological leg to stand on by agreeing with him was that it's not fair to penalize children for the mistakes of their parents. Except if this was really and only about fairness and not punishing kids for the mistakes of their parents, then why do we have borders at all? There are plenty of children suffering throughout the world for circumstances they had nothing to do with. So why don't we bring all of them here and give all of them access to the welfare state? See that as your productivity and prosperity. Why is it fair for middle class Americans to buy a 70 inch television set with so much suffering in the world? Shouldn't the government cap television purchases at 42 inches and redistribute the rest of the wealth to fight global poverty? Come to think of it, who really even needs a 42-inch television set or television at all, for that matter? Is it fair that First Lady Michelle Obama wore a $1,000 skirt on a trip to Hawaii in 2011? Shouldn't she have bought a cheaper skirt at Walmart and given the rest of the money to feed the children, which says $1 per day feeds eight hungry children in the United States? How many children starved because Mrs. Obama spent $1,000 on a skirt instead of $24.99? During the 2013 government shutdown, and how can something be shut down when it's still operating at 83% capacities beyond me? 
But we learned when many of them were furloughed that Michelle Obama had a record number of paid staff for a first lady. Did Michelle Obama really need two dozen taxpayer-funded staff members? When as recently as Mamie Eisenhower, the first lady had to pay for her loan assistant out of her own pockets? How many illegals have to remain living in the shadows so that Michelle Obama can get her nails done? And while we're at it, why is it fair to cap the fairness at kids whose parents successfully arrived here illegally? Where do we get off not providing fairness to the children of parents who haven't been able to illegally and successfully cross our borders? Not to mention, what about all the Latinos and other minorities currently waiting in line to immigrate to this country legally? Why is it fair to bypass all of them? In less than a few hundred words, I was able to pose several easily understandable questions that reverse the liberals' premise and use it against them, including citing three examples of their own politicians to reinforce my point. What is more likely to persuade our fellow Americans to our side? The tactics I am suggesting or the boring and contrived talking points our guys usually regurgitate over and over again to the already converted on Fox News. Humor can even be used to reverse the left's premise on an issue as divisive and potentially hostile as the debate over the definition of marriage. In 2013, I wrote a column for USA Today attacking those for redefining marriage as being hypocrites. I wrote, those arguing for marriage equality at the U.S. Supreme Court this week should be ashamed of themselves. They're just as guilty of discrimination as those dastardly conservatives still bitterly clinging to their guns and their religion. Why no argument for polygamy, polyamory, and other forms of diversity? Why are they only defending their exclusive definition of diversity? How dare those seeking to overturn the Defense of Marriage Act signed by President Clinton or Proposition 8 ratified by the people of California stop it just redefining marriage to include two consenting adults of the same gender? Why do these people believe they have the authority to draw a moralistic line against any consenting adults and thus force their moral standard upon the rest of us? Besides, society's views on these other progressive forms of relationship diversity are shifting. And shouldn't we always base our concept of right and wrong off of what we see on TV, just like our gender-neutral maternal units taught us? Who better to consult on moral matters than the huddled masses that paid money to see all those Saw and Hostile movies? For example, there is a popular reality show on basic cable called Sister Wives about the lost art of polygamy. Showtime is airing a trailblazing show on the multiple wedded bliss of polyamory. Oh sure, Showtime also features a series with a creepy old dude watching 1970s porn with Z-list celebrities as well, but who are we to judge? Why would those seeking to redefine marriage to include homosexual monogamy play right into the hands of those draconian religious fundamentalists who think they and their alleged God have the authority to narrowly define love among consenting adults? Why aren't those arguing for marriage equality being inclusive by including marriage among multiple consenting adults as well? Besides, polygamy is in the Bible, no less. Abraham, David, and Solomon are just some of that dusty old book's heroes who were polygamists. No member of the American Taliban can claim their puny God destroyed a whole city over polygamy, so why not be more inclusive? If the government has no power to discriminate against relationships involving two consenting adults of the same gender, then why does it have the power to discriminate against multiple consenting adults of any gender? Next thing you know, we'll be back to banning interracial dating. If we're truly champions of diversity, it's time to embrace polygamy, polyamory, or multiple marriage. What better way for children to learn about different cultures and belief systems than to grow up around them in their own families? Imagine children being born into a household where each dad has a different religion, each mom speaks a different language, and then sometimes the dads are attracted to one another as well as the moms and vice versa. Talk about covering all your bases. What a richness of blessed diversity could be found in such an endeavor. It's time for the marriage equality movement to stop being hypocrites and cease practicing its own form of discrimination, and to stop compromising with pro-marriage bigots. Take a principled stand. Either all of us get to do whatever we want with as many whomevers as we want, or none of us are equal. Now, reversing the premise of the left's arguments like this and using it against them is one of the most effective and devastating ways to make our point. But to pull it off, we need to be confident of our principles and have the required courage of conviction something that is sorely lacking in most of our guys. And that was uh, chapter 8 of uh, 
the remainder of Chapter 8 of Rules for Patriots, How Conservatives Can Win Again by Steve Deese. But again, uh, a lot of this, uh, what he was doing was sarcastic. It's meant for, by the way, he doesn't say, and shame on him for not doing that, but it's meant for the public conservative, the talk show hosts and the office holders, not for the rank and file like you and me. If you and I go to work and we're in the the break room and we start to get the business for Mr. Socialist and we pull this stunt, even if we manage to write down everything that he has just said and memorize it and commit it to memory, can you imagine doing that, standing there in the break room uh, regurgitating what he just said? People are going to look at you like you're crazy. It doesn't work for the rank and file. Uh, The other thing is that you have to remember, sarcasm goes Uh, is a little goes a long, long way. So be sparing with it. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, Bishop Robert Barron. Most of us live, frankly, most of the time in various levels of hell, you know, and we're, and we're dealing with these deadly sins. Like envy flows from pride, because if I'm prideful, I'm a black hole, I'm in curvatus and say, I'm collapsed in. What am I really going to be concerned about? That guy's got more attention than I am. That guy's richer than I am. Th- th- that that lady, she's got a bigger reputation than I do. And why why don't I have that? Right. Mm-hmm. So envy is a very close daughter of pride. Um, anger flows from me. <laughs> why do I get angry? The dog isn't getting angry on the beach when he's running after the tennis ball. But I get angry all the time. I sputter with anger when things aren't going my way and and you're insulting me and you're not doing what I want and I'm being hurt, my reputation. So anger flows from pride, you know. All of them do. All of the deadly sins do. Most of us live. And that was Bishop Robert Barron. Back in a minute. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the Ayn Rand quote of the day. It is the businessman's money that supports American universities in the form of voluntary private contributions donations, endowments, etc. In preparation for this lecture, I tried to do some research on the nature and amounts of such contributions. I had to give it up. It is too complex and too vast a field for the efforts of one person. All I can say is only that millions and millions and millions of dollars are being donated to universities by big business enterprises every year and that the donors have no idea what their money is being spent on or whom it is supporting. What is certain is only the fact that some of the worst anti-business, anti-capitalism propaganda has been financed by businessmen in such projects. And that was uh, the Ayn Rand quote of the day. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Now a little bit of uh, Maria Bartiromo. Christian. 
You know, I think there are a couple of things going on that are that really make note. First of all, contrast what is going on with Israel. They're warning civilians to get out of the way, uh, and in doing so, creating more risk for themselves. They are basically saying, we're coming in to Gaza City, get out, and that tells the enemy what you're going to do, but Israel is willing to do that to help preserve a civilian life among their notional enemies here, in contrast to Hamas, which t- intentionally targeted, killed elderly women, infants. It's just a big moral difference that I think is important. The second, So uh, he's, he's saying exactly what I've been saying, is that um, what, if Israel wants to win, they have to publicly say that there is no, uh, there are no civilians in Gaza. There are none. And that it's true. It's the absolute truth. There are none. Everybody in Gaza is part of the Hamas organization. There's no people that are outside that organization. It is a one-party state. Uh, you're part of that organization, and uh, you have a mission, a military mission. It might be to be a human shield. It might be to be a martyr, but it's still a military mission. So they're all part of the military, and so uh, they're, they need to, if they're going to successfully um, kick ass, if you will, they have to say no civilians. Because right now all it's setting themselves up for is good PR. Well, Israel lost, but at least they didn't kill any civilians. Uh, yeah, that's not going to cut it. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, Stuart Varney's My Take. Reading indeed. Sentiment is dropping, Stu. And that appears to be something the market likes because we've gone a little bit higher yeah. after and reached those numbers. Ashley, thanks very much indeed. Now this. <sighs> Today, in New York City, many parents will keep their children home from school. All police officers have been told to report for duty in uniform, no excuses. You can see them heavily armed, patrolling the streets, especially near Jewish schools and temples. All of this after Khalid Mishal, a former leader of Hamas, called for a day of jihad. New York, with a large Jewish population, has to take the threat seriously. It's a likely target. You know, this city has gone from one disaster to another. It's been an awful decade. For eight years, New York City was run into the ground by a socialist mayor, Bill de Blasio. He campaigned against the police, and the city went through a crime surge that still continues. The pandemic lockdowns went on for far too long. The office buildings are still half empty. The schools never recovered. Then came the migrants. The city was, and still is, overwhelmed. And now our Jewish friends and colleagues are threatened by the same terrorists who murdered Jewish women and children in Israel. Demonstrators are on the streets with deliberately hateful messages. And in the colleges here, anti-Semitism runs unchecked. That's New York today. The poster child of urban decline. Second hour of Varney just getting started. So, um, yeah, this uh, Stuart Varney's my take again. He makes the mistake of referring to them as migrants. They're not... Animals migrate, peoples immigrate and emigrate. And then as far as the unchecked anti-Semitism, it is checked in that there are businesses that are hitting back. There's businesses that are going out and and publicizing the pictures and the names of the people that uh, signed uh, anti-Semitic statements. And then there's also uh, businesses that are saying that they're going to boycott students from Harvard, Yale, and other anti-Semitic schools. So it is there is some pushback, and there is a reason to have a little bit of hope. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. So I just heard something on the radio that really bothered me. It was a promo for a uh, erstwhile uh, conservative talk show in which the guy says, well, I don't care who it is uh, that breaks the law. I don't care if it's Joe Biden or Ronald Reagan, for that matter. Uh, you know, if you get if you break the law, then you deserve to be prosecuted and go to prison. But the, what he's missing here is who's more likely to break the law, Joe Biden or Ronald Reagan. See, that's why I'm a conservative. That's why I have a tendency to lean Republican. 
but definitely why I'm a conservative, because we're the good guys. We are much less likely to break the law than the scumbag socialists who live to break the law. What he's doing here is called moral equivalency. And uh, the, the conservatives and the Republicans have been whining about the left's moral equivalencies for decades, but it is really the Republicans who are trying to uh, bend over backwards, tr trying to kiss the ass of socialists to prove to socialists that they're fair, that they're even-handed. But the fact of the matter is, life is not fair. You see, conservatives are better people than socialists. That's just the way it is. Life is slanted in favor of the conservatives. It's just the way it is. That's why I'm a conservative. And that's why I'm not neutral. And that's basically what this, this butthole was doing, was pretending to be neutral. Hey, I'm just neutral. I don't care. Uh, you know, I don't uh, go this way or that way. I'm just, uh, you know, just don't break the law. I don't care what you do. Don't break the law. I do care what you do. And any real conservative, any true conservative cares, any true conservative is a true conservative because they know with every ounce of their body that being truly conservative is best. It's best for me, it's best for my family, it's best for my neighborhood, for my state, and for my country. And as I've said before, if you can't get into that, if you uh, th claim to be a conservative, but you have doubts about whether or not conservatism is what's best for everybody, get lost. Thank you, thank you. And now, a little bit of Chad Prather. Y'all, I'm nervous. I'm at the house, and we're way out here away from the police, man. And I'm watching the news, and people are going crazy, burning things down, looting and burning and mob violence and crazy. And people send me messages saying, Chad, what you going to do if people come to your house? What's going to happen? Are you going to call the police and have to wait 30 minutes for them to show up? I don't know. Man, I'm, I'm just so tore up. My stomach's eat up and everything. I don't know what in the world we're going to do. Got lawlessness on the American streets. Chad, hopefully, hopefully the government will come to save me. Maybe. I'll tell you. These are times when you really got to start thinking about things like, where can I hide whenever the bad people come? Get your Defend the Police shirt at watchchad.com. I love you. God bless. And trust me when I tell you. We ain't even put a dent in the ammo pile yet. And that was uh, Chad Prather, and it was a, a video that he was shooting, and he's walking around in a room, I assume it's a basement, and it's filled with uh, firearms. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, One America News. Israel remains under attack by Hamas terrorists after they massacred hundreds of innocent men, women, and children. And here at One American News, we want to make it clear that we stand by Israel and denounce the terrorist attacks. Israel is America's biggest ally in the Middle East. We invite you to support them as well. One organization you can give back to is Friends of the IDF, Israel Defense Forces. To fight evil, IDF soldiers will need supplies like helmets, bulletproof vests, ambulances, and much more. 100% of your donations will go to meet IDF soldiers' emergency needs. If you'd like to donate, you can head to FIDF.org. You can also easily find that information on our website, OANN.com. And that was OANN. Back in a minute.
Thank you, thank you. And now, Aristotle for everybody. Difficult thought made easy. Chapter 17. Logic's Little Words. As Newton's name is associated with the law of gravitation, so Aristotle's is associated with the law of contradiction. As Einstein's name is to the theory of relativity, so Aristotle's is to the theory of the syllogism. Two words lie at the heart of the law of contradiction, is and is not. Two pairs of words are central to the theory of the syllogism, Aristotle's account of correct and incorrect reasoning. They are if and then, since and therefore. As a rule of thought, the law of contradiction tells us primarily what not to do. It is a law against contradiction, a law that commands us to avoid contradicting ourselves, either in our speech or in our thought. It tells us that we should not answer a question by saying both yes and no. Stated in another way, it tells us that we should not affirm and deny the same proposition. If I say or think that Plato was Aristotle's teacher, I should avoid saying or thinking that Plato was not Aristotle's teacher. To say or think that would be to deny something that I have affirmed. You may ask why this rule of thought is so basic and so sound. Aristotle's answer is that the law of contradiction is not only a rule of thought, but also a statement about the world itself, about the realities we try to think about. The law of contradiction as a statement about reality says what is immediately obvious to common sense. A thing, whatever it may be, cannot both exist and not exist at the same time. It either exists or it does not exist, but not both at once. A thing cannot have a certain attribute and not have that attribute at the same time. The apple in my hand that I'm looking at cannot, at this instant, be both red in colour and not red in colour. This is so very obvious that Aristotle calls the law of contradiction self-evident. Its self-evidence for him means its undeniability. It is impossible to think that the apple is both red and not red at the same time, just as it is impossible to think that a part is greater than the whole to which it belongs. It is impossible to think that a tennis ball that you hit over the fence is to be found in the grass that lies beyond and, at the same time, to think that it cannot be found there because it no longer exists. The law of contradiction as a statement about reality itself underlies the law of contradiction as a rule of thought. The law of contradiction as a statement about reality describes the way things are. The law of contradiction as a rule of thought prescribes the way we should think about things if we wish our thinking about them to conform to the way things are. When a pair of statements are contradictory, both cannot be true, nor can both be false. One must be true, the other false. Plato either was or was not Aristotle's teacher. All swans are white, or some are not. However, if instead of saying that some swans are not white, which contradicts the statement that all swans are white, I had said no swans are white, a contradiction would not have resulted. People who are not acquainted with Aristotle's distinction between contradictory and contrary statements may be surprised by this. It is possible for both of these statements, all swans are white and no swans are white, to be false, though both cannot be true. Some swans may be white and some black, in which case it is false to say that all swans are white or that none is. Aristotle calls a pair of statements contrary, not contradictory, when both cannot be true, but both can be false. Is there a pair of statements, both of which can be true, but both of which cannot be false? Yes, according to Aristotle. The statement that some swans are white and the statement that some swans are not white can both be true, but both cannot be false. Swans must be either white or not white, and so, if only some are white, some must be not white. Aristotle calls this pair of statements sub-contrary. Suppose, however, that instead of saying that some swans are white and some swans are not white, I had said, some swans are white and some swans are black. Would that pair of statements have been sub-contrary? Impossible for both to be false? 
know, because some swans might be grey or green, yellow or blue. White and black are not exclusive alternatives. It is not true that any visible object must be either white or black. This being the case, it will not do to pose as the contrary of all swans are white, the statement, all swans are black, but neither may be true and both can be false. To state the contrary of all swans are white, one must say, no swans are white, not all swans are black. Unlike black and white, some pairs of terms, which are contrary terms, do exhaust the alternatives. For example, all integers or whole numbers are either odd or even. There is no third possibility. When one uses terms that are exclusive alternatives, it is possible to state a contradiction without using is and is not. The statement that any given whole number is an odd number is contradicted by the statement that that number is an even number because if it is odd, it is not even, and if it is even, it is not odd, and it must be one or the other. I cannot exaggerate the importance of Aristotle's rules concerning statements that are incompatible with one another in one of these three ways, through being contradictory of one another, through being contrary to one another, or sub-contrary to one another. The importance is that observing these rules not only helps us to avoid making inconsistent statements, but also helps us to detect inconsistencies in the statements made by others and to challenge what they say. When a person we are conversing with contradicts himself or herself or makes contrary statements, we have every right to stop him and say, you cannot make both of those statements. Both cannot be true. Which of the two do you really mean? Which do you want to claim as true? It is particularly important to observe that general statements, statements containing the word all, can be contradicted by a single negative instance. To contradict the generalization that all swans are white, one needs only to point to a single swan that is not white. That single negative instance falsifies the generalization. Scientific generalizations are put to the test in this way. The claim that they are true can be upheld only so long as no negative instances are found to falsify them. Since the search for negative instances is an unending one, a scientific generalization can never be regarded as finally or completely verified. Human beings are prone to generalize, especially in their thinking about other human beings who differ from themselves in sex, race, or religion. If they are men, they will permit themselves to say, unthinkingly one hopes, that all women are such and such. If they are white persons, they will permit themselves to say that all black, are so and so. If they are Protestants, they will permit themselves to say that all Catholics are this or that. In every one of these cases, one negative instance suffices to invalidate the generalization. And the more negative instances one can point to, the easier it is to show how wild the generalization was in the first place. The use of contrary terms such as black and white or odd and even brings into play another set of words that control our thinking according to certain rules, either or and not both. For example, when we toss a coin to decide something, we know that when it lands, it must be either heads or tails, not both. That is a strong disjunction. There are, however, weak disjunctions in which something may be either this or that and perhaps both, they're not in the same respect or at the same time. To say of tomatoes that they are either red or green permits us to say that one and the same tomato can be both red and green, but at different times. Disjunctions, especially strong disjunctions, enable us to make simple, direct inferences. If we know that a whole number is not odd, we can infer immediately that it must be even. Similarly, if we know that a whole number is not a prime number we can infer immediately that it must be divisible by numbers other than itself and one. When we see that the tossed coin has landed heads up, we know at once that we, who bet on tails, have lost the toss. We do not have to turn the coin over to be sure of that. Inferences of this sort, Aristotle calls immediate inferences, because one goes immediately from the truth or falsity of one statement to the truth or falsity of another. No steps of reasoning are involved. 
If one knows that it is true that all swans are white, one also knows immediately that some swans are white, and in addition one knows that at least some white objects are swans. One can make mistakes in this simple process of inference, and mistakes are frequently made. For example, from the fact that all swans are white, it is correct to infer that some white objects are swans, but quite incorrect to infer that all white objects are swans. That incorrect inference Aristotle calls an illicit conversion. The class of white objects is larger than the class of swans. Swans are only some of the white objects in the world. To make the mistake of thinking that because all swans are white, we can also say that all white objects are swans, is to treat the two classes as coextensive, which they are not. Two... And that was uh, part one of chapter 18, Aristotle for Everybody, Difficult Thought Made Easy by Mortimer Adler. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. This is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States. Today, bidding adios to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there and reminding you to be honest, smart, and beautiful, and remember that the left has no authority, no power, and they can't win.